In this episode of STEMiverse, Marcus and I talk with Ariane Scapettis. Ariane is currently a learning technologist in higher ed with qualifications and expertise in e-learning, blended learning and K-12 education. She has held numerous roles throughout her lengthy career in education. Teacher, computer coordinator, ICT consultant in Sydney Region Schools and now as a learning technologist at UTS, the University of Technology in Sydney. Ariane has seen it all, from the introduction of the internet to schools in the early 1990s to modern game-based learning, flipping the classroom and using mobile phones to enhance educational outcomes. This is STEMiverse episode 11. Welcome to STEMiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. I'm Peter Dalmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpie, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. So, Ariane, thank you very much for joining us in this episode of Stemiverse. I think it's episode 11. Wow. Going up there. <laughs> Just time flies. We're just halfway through the year now, uh, so this is uh, officially episode 11, We're, we've gone past number 10. Mm. We're very excited to have you on. Uh, you are a learning technologist uh, working at UTS. Uh, now, UTS is a special university for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I finished my PhD and my postgraduate degrees at UTS, and Marcus? I did not finish my undergraduate degree at UTS, <laughs> You've been that, but I did my postgraduate <laughs> yes. at Sydney. So, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's one of those places that a uh, special place in our heart. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, we, looking, we are looking forward to explore your rich history in education. So we'd like to give you a few minutes, or actually take as much time as you want, <laughs> to, t- to tell us a few things about you. Um, you can go as far back as you like. Uh, we want to know what your motivation may have been in order to become an educator and be involved in education and how kind of all that brought you to where you are today as a learning technologist at UTS. Okay well thanks guys. Um, I started my teaching career back in a long long time ago in the 80s, the mid 80s, oh, I should say at about 86. So I graduated in 85 so I started teaching in 86 um, and I had my first permanent appointment with the Department of Education in 88, um, 1988. So I have been teaching ever since then, but my career has sort of taken some different directions along the way. So I started as a classroom teacher, um, teaching K to six students. Um, my first job was at Cabramatta. So I worked with lots of refugee kids who were, you know, who'd come to Australia, struggling with English. Um, so it was a very rewarding job working with these young children who had very traumatic um, experiences on boats who had come to Australia. So they came from Cambodia, Thailand, Laos. Um, so they had lots of English-speaking um, issues. They couldn't speak well. A lot of them sat with their dictionaries and sort of followed along. And it was quite rewarding. And I was there for, I think I was there for approximately five years at that school. So I would say it was one of my favourite schools. Out of all the schools I've actually taught at, that was the most rewarding. And I was quite young. You know, I was in my early 20s back then, you know, so I sort of felt like a kid as well. I sort of fitted in quite nicely. Um, So from then on, I then went on to do some further studies. I did a grad dip in computer education when my children were quite young um, and I could see technology was having an impact in education and I thought I needed to really upskill and see where that would take me. Um, So I studied for two years in a grad dip and um, I then became a computer coordinator and a computer teacher in a school. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching students educational technology lessons, teaching very closely with the teachers in the school um, and working in a computer lab. So I was teaching the whole school, K to six, Mm-hmm. in a computer lab. So I was the computer coordinator, computer teacher, and they were the days when the internet first arrived in a school. We had one computer 
um, with internet. And, of course, it was dial-up, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Um, and this computer sat in the staff room and it was like the internet was the biggest thing that had happened. Wow. So I remember those things. <laughs> yeah, I was in a school and I still remember that. You know, teachers used to walk past this computer and go, that's the computer with the internet. There was one designated computer. So we've come a long way since those days where we've got, you know, our smartphones in our hands, you know, it's become ubiquitous, you know, in your hand all the time. Um, so, yeah, that's – and I ended up teaching there for 10 years. I was the computer coordinator doing professional learning. I was involved in networking the whole school. Oh. Um, yeah, and I taught in a computer lab that was totally networked. It was a Mac lab. I was going to ask, what did you use? Okay. Yeah, we had – we had those very colourful computers. Do you remember those the, um, the Apple computers? Yeah. The iMacs. And I was the one who had to unbox them because with the technology for learning rollouts in schools, I unboxed them, set them up. Um, I even had children helping me set up the computers in the computer lab. So, yeah, so I was all part of that change. The change was happening so rapidly. And then the new rollout. Yeah. And what so, did you teach with on the IMAX? Like what software did you use? Okay, so we had, I can't even remember the software, but I taught them PowerPoint. I remember PowerPoint was with the younger students. They had to create, instead of having paper-based presentations, they had PowerPoints mm -hmm. because Microsoft PowerPoint was so new back in the day. And the students thought, wow, I can add some transitions, I can add some little animations. But I was also teaching with iMovie. So we had iMovie and we had Claris Works. I was even teaching them very simple spreadsheet formulas and teaching them, you know, how to balance a little spreadsheet. And the students absolutely loved it. So it, I taught kindergarten. So we were even using um, a really lovely software program and I can't even remember the name of it. Maybe um, HyperCard or Logo? No, we did HyperCard. We had HyperCard as well. There was a bit of programming in HyperCard. But there was another one. Oh, it was a... It was a while back. <laughs> and I can't think of it. It will come to me later. It's been like 30 years. It was a yes. wonderful program <laughs> for younger students. So how, how did these amazing gadgets that suddenly flooded the computer labs or the, the classes... How did that transform students' learning experiences? You already mentioned that it was exciting for them. They could do animations with the PowerPoint presentations, uh, then iMovie. And what was the essence of the change that you saw in the way that you or your colleagues taught and how the students learned after they started using this technology? Um, I think this in the t learning became so much more engaging for them. It was sort of keeping in times. They were exposed to this technology at, at home and, of course, they were coming to school and we were integrating it quite seamlessly in the, into learning and teaching. And, of course, a lot of the teachers who came to the – who brought their students into the computer lab also stayed for the lessons. So they were there experiencing, you know, the, the learning that was happening in the classroom. So we were doing lots of planning around if they were doing some research on the internet, we were doing some pre-planning. So it could have been an HSIE lesson. Um, it could have been something around science that they were researching. So it was all integrated into their own teaching and learning. So the students were making those links between learning and technology okay. and how it all fitted in together. That uh, matches a lot with the experience that I had. Yeah, as a uh, kid. As a kid. In a Mac lab, that I actually actually missed Mac that school. stage in schools by the time the internet was around and accessible. Mm. I was in university, so I was going to ask. Uh, this sounds a lot like just using technology rather than, well, the students using software rather than creating their own software. These days, you see the students, you know, writing programs and writing their own apps, even, mm. and suddenly using Scratch. I was wondering when did you see that sort of transition from just using technology to making it take place. When I was teaching, we didn't have a lot of those um, creative sort of software type of mm -hmm. available to us. I mean, the, the closest thing we got was iMovie or using PowerPoint to create little animations. 
very simplistic sort of animations. It was when I started teaching, well, I became a consultant for the Department of Education, an ICT consultant, Mm -hmm. and that's when the iPads were out. So a lot of the iPad apps were very creative, open-ended sort of apps that went across all key learning areas. Mm -hmm. So we were running an iPad trial at Sydney Region Schools and we were looking at, we were piloting, you know, and looking at different apps. And I found when I went and spoke with the t- teachers in schools that they preferred to go for those open-ended sort of apps that allowed students to become creators rather than consumers of, you know. And so the students were creating some amazing, um, like Explain Everything, for example, which is a lovely sort of app which allows students to demonstrate their understanding of a concept. So we found that became very popular with students um, in the pilot, in the iPad pilot. So they weren't really looking at subject-specific apps, but more of those open-ended apps. Creative. So the creative, yeah, yeah, the creative sort of apps. And, uh, of course, then I was involved in a game-based learning project in Sydney Region Schools, and we looked at Kodu, which is a Microsoft um, Um, And it's a free download for students. It works very well. And the students were actually creating worlds and they were actually building their own little worlds with visual programming because Kodu is a visual programming language. So the students took that. You know, we had students from young students from primary school years up until high school actually engaging with that software and creating some amazing sort of games that were very interactive and they had to do a lot of story mapping. So there was a lot of and adding a backstory to it. So it was involving their sort of creative skills, their literacy skills, but also their visual programming and technical skills. So we found when we ran that project, there was teams of students and schools working together collaboratively and you had someone who was the designer and the other person who was writing the story. So they all had different roles. And then we had a showcase event and the students were able to articulate so well the development of how they got to that end product. And, of course, they had to create some material to advertise their game. So it was a huge hit. So we ran that over two years. So this was back in 2011 Mm -hmm. and 2012 um, that Kodu. And, of course, Kodu was very big, but also Scratch was another platform that schools are using now it's been around for a very long time um so yeah Kodu Kodu was one of my favorites and the students loved the fact that they could download their games onto a thumb drive take them home and keep working on them yeah so that's that's what you mentioned earlier about engagement because normally kids don't want to do at home what they do at school right but in this case Mm. they wanted to continue yeah and we had some students who were you know, waking up in the morning and they didn't want to go to school. And the fact that they were involved in this game-based learning project, a lot of parents were saying they had never seen their kids so excited about going to school and getting involved in this game-based learning project. So it was a really huge hit in our schools within Sydney region. Are they still using that software or has apps like Minecraft? I think it's it's still being used in schools. It's still being used in schools in conjunction with and and Scratch. I would say Kodu and Scratch, you know, are the two most popular platforms. So I want to know uh, the response that you got from students once you implemented this open-ended creative technology in the classroom obviously was very successful. What was the effect on other aspects of running a school, especially the curriculum? So were curricula adjusted to now use these new tools as part of the normal running of a class. And another thing that I wonder, so I put two questions in one, (laughs) is uh, how much of that change was introduced by initiative of the teachers versus uh, central planning by the DOE or some other higher up authority? Okay, so it all started, like we ran a project, we ran a workshop and we invited teachers who were interested in implementing this. It was part of Literacy and Numeracy Week, so we're going to create a showcase event. So the direction actually came from us as a team. So I worked closely with the Numeracy and Literacy Coordinator, consultants, and myself as an ICT consultant. So we sort of sent the message out to schools 
And teachers who were interested within schools responded, came to the workshop. They had to attend the workshop over two days, become familiar. They had to deconstruct a, an existing game and look looked at the elements of a game before they were going to introduce this back into their school. And so what they had to do was run it with their own class or with a team of students within their school. So we found a lot of the teachers were not big game-based learning um, they weren't big gamers. They didn't have to be gamers. They just had to be the mentors or introduce the platform to students. So we had created some little videos, some instructional videos, so the teachers didn't have to be experts at gaming. And what we did was we played these little videos and the teachers then actually created their own simple games in teams. So we sort of tried to replicate or model what they would do back in their schools when they went back into their schools with their students. And that was a huge success because we had one assistant principal who was in a school, um, had never played a game in her life, and and her team actually won. But she just gave them the tools. The students just worked it out amongst themselves. And she just gave them the time and support. And she was just basically there as a facilitator. Yes, so it sometimes is run by one teacher within a school. Sometimes the initiative is one teacher in a school who starts a really fantastic um, project. And then it sometimes even it sometimes even has a ripple effect to other surrounding schools or even other teachers within the school. So sometimes you need one passionate educator, like you're saying, how does it all start? Do you need direction from the top? Not always. Sometimes there's someone within the school who's who's driven. So passion is contagious, right? It's contagious. Absolutely. Uh, it sticks in, uh, to other people around your environment. And uh, what you're describing here is a transition of the teacher from somebody who talks and hopes that students are, are listening to a mentor who just creates the appropriate environment, perhaps gives a bit of encouragement uh, and direction, and then I wouldn't say sit back and relax, but uh, the, the mentor is is not supposed to actively transmit knowledge. Uh, the mentor actively creates and fosters the environment, facilitates, it facilitates the environment, right? Mm. So that's that's what you've seen. So how are things going today? Because I understand that what you're describing now happened a few years ago. If you can pinpoint in time, would that be in the 2000s? like about 10 years ago? Uh, We did this project in 2012 and it was quite successful and we ran it in 2013, both years. And we had so many more schools come on board in the second year. And then we we had a restructure in the department, so a lot of our roles disappeared. So that project didn't carry on. But I know there's lots of passionate teachers in schools who are still using this software. Why did they restructure? Like, um, this is such an important part. The Department of Education, went. they went through a restructure in terms of, and a lot of those consultancy positions went out. They either went to head office or they went out into schools. So a lot of those consultants, other positions, yes. Yeah, so. Are the projects like that running as well? Or especially, uh, is this model transitioning to becoming more mainstream so more and more schools start to use what you've learned uh, in in those years? Yes. I think a lot of schools have taken a lot of those initiatives on board, you know, quite a few schools that were involved with us. So it has sort of filtered out to other schools as well. So I have, haven't have been in a school setting. Um, I'm in a university setting at the moment. So I sort of follow a lot of this discussion and things that are happening on Twitter. So there are lots of teachers in that space. So with specific hashtags like game-based learning or iPad Ed, I can see the conversations happening globally in the Twitter sphere, like we call it, in amongst teachers. So there's lots of educators out online who are sharing some really great resources. And we find that more teachers are connected with each other. They're more willing to share lots of great ideas. And you don't have to go to workshops or conferences. They're actually learning online, anytime, anywhere, you know, with their devices. What are people using these days? Like, are they using, are they still using iPads? We hear about the decline of the iPad. Are they using Chromebooks or like, 
I should ask, what is sort of best of breed when it comes to... So you're talking more about bring your own device. I mean, a lot of schools have adopted bring your own device to schools. So some schools are very specific about what device they want the students to bring to school. Um, other schools start small. They might start with a small pilot and sort of have one class bringing their own devices, and it could be a year three, four, five, or six class. Um, other schools might just jump in and say, okay, we're all going, the whole school's going BYOD. So some schools have gone down the Chromebook path. Other schools have gone down the iPad path. It just depends on the school. So the Catholics, you know, we've got the three sectors. We've got, you know, the independent schools. We've got the state schools and we've got the Catholic schools. So they all have different directions in terms of BYOD. And sometimes they say bring any device. You know, I think most students, you know, prefer like a, either a MacBook, a MacBook Air. It depends. Yeah. High school students. I don't know what's happening in high schools. If you were a, dicta a dictator <laughs> and you could, you know, tell everybody what they should use, like which technology do you prefer? And I guess why? Like which one provides the best educational outcomes in your experience? I think even a phone, you know, can provide the best educational outcomes if you sort of get lessons to be a bit more interactive you can even do live polling or answer simple google forms using a phone so in a university setting you know a lot of students can bring their phones and they can still interact um you know the phones have become powerful tools i mean you don't necessarily need a laptop anymore a lot of things run quite seamlessly on a phone um so i'm just jumping in because i still remember what you said when about 20, 30 years ago, you were unpacking the colourful Macs in your classrooms. And back then, I think there was quite a big, big difference mm -hmm. in choosing one gadget over another, or one type of computer over another. Mm -hmm. But these days, I think that there's a more of a unification. And that's all thanks to the app ecosystem and the internet where, you know, now applications are hosted onto the internet and then you yep. just have access devices and whether that's a phone or an Android or an iOS iPad, students have a very similar experience either way. Yeah, the commoditization right. of the hardware. Commoditization, exactly. And I guess the information which you said. What you said about outcomes as well, again, this thing popped in my mind that outcomes and educational outcomes in particular seems to have changed. If you think about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, outcomes had to do more with literacy, being able to write, calculate, mm -hmm. and do those basic things. Have, have, do you think that outcomes have changed in the last 10 years as a result of introducing all these new educational technologies? Are we looking for different things now for students to be able to do and to be good at? Oh, absolutely. You know, we don't want students just to be... Um consumers anymore they have to be creative and they've given more choice in the type of assessment tasks they're creating so they're not just creating a paper-based assignment anymore or writing an essay they have to create something interactive or something that they've created and it could be like a video or uploading something like onto their YouTube account and sharing it um, or it could be for example creating like you know, a simple sound file or a podcast. So there's creativity there. That's an outcome that didn't, I don't remember in my years, no, no teacher told me you need to be more creative. You told me you need to calculate faster, you know, or make fewer <laughs> grammatical errors, but nobody said be creative. Oh, that's good. And create something new. What, what else would you say that outcomes are? I think are students like have got more choice of what they can choice. create now, you know. You know, I remember the PowerPoint was, you know, a really great tool for students back in the early 90s. Everybody you know, had to use it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody was an expert in PowerPoint. You know, I even had parents who said to me, thank goodness you taught them how to use a PowerPoint, you know, create a PowerPoint presentation because that's all they're doing in high school. <laughs> um, but if you ask high school students now what they're creating, I mean, they, they're even, like you're saying, creating an app. So is it true if I assert, say, that choice and recognition that students are different there's diversity in students so therefore they are they should be allowed to choose what they want to learn is another result of introducing this open-ended creative technology in classrooms absolutely yeah i think um 
students are sort of more in tune with lots of things. Sometimes they use things personally, but if the teacher brings it all together in a teaching and learning um, environment, the students can make those connections between these tools and teaching and learning. And they've given more choice. Like you're saying, they've got more devices, more choice. Yeah, so and and authentic. Like the assessment tasks are more authentic. They have to solve real world problems or come up with something that will solve a problem. So problem solving. Yeah. So then we're sort of jumping to say something like project based learning. You know, a lot of schools are going down that path as well. How they start off with a problem. <laughs> no, it's good. It's more reflective of real life. Yeah. So I'm a new teacher. And I've been told by my principal that I need to teach STEM. Where do I start? What 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 should I? You know, I've got the, a choice in technology that I can use. I've got a choice in apps or software that I can teach with methodologies. Methodologies. Perhaps. Where where yeah. should I start? With STEM. Okay, STEM is really big in schools at the moment. Mm -hmm. STEM's become almost like a buzzword. It's either STEM or STEAM. And if you do a hashtag STEM, you'll find lots of things. And there's lots of talk about coding. Um, where do you start? Well, I know a lot of schools, you know, are doing simple programming using Scratch. I think if you were a teacher in a school, I think I would start with Scratch or Kodu. Some of those simple um, visual programming or Scratch, for example, for the people listening to the podcast who don't know what Scratch is, what is Scratch? Okay, so Scratch is a very simple, It's you can start um, with Scratch, which is a very simple um, programming language. And I think students as young as, yeah, say, year two or year three are using, they're like little building programming blocks that students can create. Like Python or is it oh, like Oh, no, Python? it's not. I think they're little sort of set tasks or little building blocks. Graphical of. blocks. Python is more language, isn't it? It's a text, yeah, text-based traditional, mm -hmm. traditional language. So, yeah, but Scratch very much is visual programming where you've got little blocks. Yes. You drag those blocks and you form little, I guess, algorithms and little programs that yeah. do their thing. Yeah. yeah. It's suited for kids of a very young age where they're not necessarily able to, to write or type well yet but they can understand those little graphical blocks because they look like drawings mm -hmm. and if they've had some experience with puzzles then they almost immediately get the concept because just like puzzles the scratch blocks just hook one into the other if they're compatible otherwise mm -hmm. they don't fit so and they don't work color coded so it's very it's a very clever way of introducing programming to kids Oh, yeah, and computational thinking concepts. So both platforms, I would start there. If I was starting with um, programming, I would start with either Scratch or Kodu. So how much does Scratch cost? I'm not quite sure. I think it's free, isn't it? I wonder, you have a very rich experience and you have seen the change in education from when the internet was at its very beginnings to now where it's everywhere. <laughs> Mm -hmm. everywhere Using, totally everywhere like you, you even when you sleep actually you are connected to the internet like mm -hmm. my application monitors my sleeping pattern and in, in the morning you said you had 70 percent quality of sleep so the internet is with me constantly mm -hmm. <laughs> so i wonder if you were given i wouldn't say a reasonable budget and they said to you so here's some reasonable budget i'd like you to design your ideal classroom say k to six not so much university. What would the classroom look like, taking into account the methodologies of modern methodologies of teaching and philosophy and the technologies that are out there, plus you know, the effect that we had in curriculums mm -hmm. and in outcomes? What would it look like? Okay, so I think the space would be very different to your traditional classroom. So you wouldn't have students sitting at desks. Um, the classroom would be more agile, allow for cooperation and students working with devices. You can have sort of one area where students were actually making things or like, you know, a lot of the maker spaces that are in libraries now, you could have, have like a little robotics type of, you know, it's, a lot of schools are using spheros and a lot of, so you could have an area of your classroom where you, the students could go and sit and sort of create, you know, or make things. Um, you could have another little. So the the classroom would look totally different to what 
a traditional classroom would look like. So I would not even have proper tables and chairs. So students could actually move around and adjust the furniture to the specific task that they were working on. Um, so, yeah, sort of lots of modular, agile to sort, of a, sort of spaces. Um, and I would have devices. I mean, even having some iPads in the classroom, some, maybe some Chromebooks, like a variety of different tools. So students could have choice in the type of technology that they would use. I wouldn't be specific. I'd say this is your task. Um, you've got a choice of what you're going to what you're going to use. So we're giving students a bit of more choice around. Um, they're still going to get to the same outcome, but you're giving them that, that student choice in the classroom. So. And uh, what about the teacher in such a classroom? I think the teacher would be on – the teacher would sort of give them the task and then be a facilitator, a little bit like that game-based learning project that I was talking about, how that teacher sort of st- took a step back and allowed the students to work as a team. Um, and students usually f- find the teams they like to work with and they find their little homogenous sort of little group and – and you see that with students even at universities, they have to do group tasks. You know, we need to encourage that a lot more because they're going to be going out into the real world and they will be working in teams. Exactly. So what now I wonder about the teacher. Like imagine that I'm a geography teacher and suddenly my principal puts me in a learning space like the one he just built. <laughs> totally open, configurable devices of all sorts and kinds. And my, my principal says, okay, Peter, now... You are a facilitator. <laughs> what do I do? Like, where do I start? Um, do I need to retrain myself? Do I need to read books? Do I need to go to What should I do? I think you need to step back and think about your teaching style. I think it's a teaching style too, isn't it? How are we going to impart that knowledge to students in a more creative way where we're not actually sitting at the front driving our lesson with a PowerPoint? You have to sort of think, you know, how am I going to get that knowledge? Am I going to flip my classroom and maybe get them to watch a video before they come to class? And maybe during that class time, I might leave it open for discussion about various geography concepts that they came across in the video. So a lot of schools are doing that. So instead of wasting their time sort of looking at a video about, you know, a geography, particular geography topic about the rivers of Australia, what have you, they actually watch a video in their own time and then come back. And they, you could provide a bit of scaffolding around that video. You you make them look out for specific things. So you use that classroom time to really have that rich discussion. Um, and you could have some students going off and creating something, other students writing a report about something that they saw in the video. So the whole teaching and learning has shifted you know we have to sort of shift and transform you know the teacher in front of the classroom as the person who knows everything so it's, mm-hmm. it's like an open society as, as i think of i've got images as you're talking it's just an open society i think it's like a, a marketplace of ideas now traditional teaching is more like um a speech it's like top to bottom kind of transmission of knowledge. Uh, a modern classroom could be a lot more like uh, a busy marketplace where things are just happening on the fly in almost real time and there's a lot of um, like organic change, mm-hmm. like a natural environment type of change in it and therefore a lot of new knowledge generated in, in all directions just by keeping it open and fluid. Mm-hmm. Agile. So, Agile is a good word for that, yeah. So we've heard about what you did for the department and both teaching and as a consultant. What are you doing for UTS now? Hmm. Okay, at UTS I work very closely with the academics. So we're trying to get them to move away from um, standing in front of a, a classroom and driving the learning with a PowerPoint. And I remember going to university and sitting in mass lectures and hearing the person at the front. So I work very closely around creating um, flip learning, ex- helping the academics to think beyond a PowerPoint. How are they going to present their content in a more interesting and engaging way? And a lot of them actually create introductory videos, introducing themselves to the subject, talking about what the subject is about, 
and that's up on the subject, up online before the students start, you know, interacting with their learning management system. So we're looking beyond the learning management system to what other tools can we incorporate. So Google Drive, a lot of them are using Google Drive and they might be sending out like a a questionnaire where the students fill in the questionnaire or they watch a video and then fill in the Google form. So they're doing a lot of that collaborative um, synchronous and asynchronous um, collaboration using the Google Docs. There's so many great things and a lot of them do a lot of Kahoot. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of Kahoot, which is a game-based learning um, program where they quiz the students and they're using their mobile devices to answer a series of questions. So there's Lots of really good game-based learning things just to get like springboard into the lesson. So, you know, a lot of academics say this, this is my issue. Students are bringing their devices into the lecture theatre or into the tutorial. How am I going to engage them with the tools they're bringing with their phones? So we're trying to find ways to sort of make make that link with learning because a lot of students are very confident in using their phones in a personal way but how can we make those linkages with teaching and learning? You've talked about flipping lessons and flipping the classroom. What do you mean by that? Okay, so it's basically getting students to do some work or pre-work before they come to class. And sometimes that's not very successful because a lot of students think, you know, I'm coming to learn from my academic. I don't have to do these pre-tasks, but they miss the really rich conversations and so they have to do some readings or they might have to watch a video. So it's basically doing pre-tasks so you're prepared when you come to class. So that's what the flipped classroom looks like. So how do you make that successful? How do you make it work? Students don't like homework. (laughs) And you have a little buggers to actually do the work before coming. (laughs) Before they come. So they have to do a reading. So I think it's all... Sometimes academics sort of um, stated in an announcement, they say, this is what you have to do. It's all clear or they have to follow a, like a learning module. So you have to watch this, like a series of steps. So it's sometimes scaffolded to work quite well. So there's a little bit of scaffolding around the task. Okay. And the students can see the journey or the step by step. Okay. You've talked about the gamification of the classroom as well. Is that part of it? So if the student does their pre-work, they get points or badges or, you know, oh, whatever. In- incentives. The uh, virtual currency yeah. is, uh, if they do uh, their in- pre-work. Incentive psychology. Incentives, that's the <laughs> word I'm looking for. What, what yeah, chocolate. we haven't used badges. <laughs> I know badges are used in some universities. They have like the gamification of learning using badges. Um, we haven't adopted that here at UTS, but... There's a lot of talk about, you know, doing something along that line where the students collect. Um, And I've seen it work in a primary setting where students use like class dojo where they get different rewards and they can go into their class dojo account and see their rewards. We don't have anything similar to that here at a university level, but I think that would work really well. But I think something like Kahoot, which is a game, they have like a leaderboard. So the students go in with an alias and they can see how they're performing against the other students in the class. So if it's a tutorial of, say, 30 students, you know, they get really involved with their phones and it's usually the fastest person. So the phone becomes almost like a clicker. Mm -hmm. Um, So they have other, there's other, some other really great tools as well, like Poll Everywhere and... um, Um, Socrative is one tool that I've used. And Mentimeter. I don't know, you've probably heard some of these yeah. And they're all browser-based, or they work quite well. Some of them, you know, you can even download as a little app yeah. on your phone. For better performance. Um, so what do you do in instances where the, the kids or the young adults don't have a smartphone? Oh, has, has it happened? <laughs> yeah, I wonder. <laughs> they do have computers as well yes. in the classroom. Yeah, I haven't come across. You could probably even get them to work in teams because Cahoots allows teams as well. So students can teach, sit in pairs or threes and they can um, work together in groups. So for students, so a student doesn't feel like they're missing out. But there's also in the School of Education here at UTS, you know, they have iPads as well, which they bring iPads into the, into the classrooms. UTS can also lend uh, laptops and I think iPads as well to students 
uh, when, at least when I was at GTS, you could borrow right. a laptop for a session on, or even for like for a class session or even for a semester. Right. So there are opportunities, but uh, in my classes, when I was teaching at UTS, it was rare for a student not to have a smartphone. So I used to use Socrative, which is an application that allows students to respond to questions in real time. And then you can see all the statistics. Mm -hmm of the answers, who said yes, who said no, or the percentages. So I, I've got to say that that was uh, usually the highlight of those classes where, okay, we've been talking for 15, 20 minutes about this, now let's see what you think. And that's where everybody wakes up mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way on the phones and answering the questions. Um, a lot more even than if there were no smartphones and just verbally ask the question, who thinks this, who thinks that? Uh, some people might put their hand up. <laughs> and not, engage or not but all the the animation the graphics the, the colors on the screen they wanted to see where they stand against others so mm -hmm. there's the gamification and the competitive spirit that suppose everybody has all that comes up and we exploit it in order to teach and i've also wanted to quickly mention my experience from teaching in building 11 uh, a few years ago with the new classrooms the, the computer-based classrooms where the pods yes so you've got the collaborative these, pods yeah so you've got uh as pods as they're called they, they consist of a large screen with a computer integrated to it and a desk that about five or six students can can fit in all right uh, there's a lectern in the middle with a computer there's no whiteboard no, nothing to project through that computer in the lectern you can send images or videos to the screens on the porch and then assign small tasks to them. And I remember that before that, I was, of course, used to the traditional way of teaching where there's the um, there's a projector, there's mm -hmm. the lectern, you can use a laser pointer to show things, and all that suddenly was taken away. <laughs> and then just because of the setting, just because of the environment, the class had to become a lot more um, collaborative, more collaborative. Yeah, the discussions then really took on uh, compared to the way they was before with forty minutes lecture. How did the lecturers adjust to the new style? It, it for some it took whole semesters right. to adjust okay. because I, I wasn't really retrained. <laughs> I just here's my new classroom. <laughs> Where's the whiteboard? <laughs> there was no whiteboard. Yeah, it took a few a few weeks to adjust. And the same for the students. The students didn't know what, what they were supposed to do. So there was like an adjustment necessary on both sides. But I've got to say that by the end of it, it was just so much better. Like it became natural. We couldn't go back mm -hmm. to the old way of doing things. Okay, cool. Great work. We had a lot of teachers in schools when the connected classrooms came out in schools. You know, I forgot to talk about the interactive whiteboards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and... A lot of teachers, a lot of teachers were really, it was a big learning curve and I was responsible to upskill them with a connected class, you know, with the interactive whiteboards. And of course, then we had the connected classroom and we can do vi live video conferences and virtual excursions in schools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the technology came a long way. And I remember teachers saying, I want a board to write on, you know, they, they couldn't write on these connected interactive whiteboards, you know, and they said, I want a whiteboard I can write on next to my interactive whiteboard. So it took a lot of time to adjust. It, the technology was a bit clunky as well. I remember it was not easy to write on the interactive whiteboards. You try to make a line and the line would be this thick. Now, you can't see it if you were listening to the podcast, but about like two centimeters or three centimeters it's thick. thick yep. So you're trying to do a diagram with a few details and just wouldn't display it properly. But it's matured a lot more since then. It's a lot better. So, of course, with the interactive whiteboards, um, a lot of schools were using them to create some really interesting, like, little videos and animations. So they were used as a creative tool as well. It wasn't just a teacher-driven tool. So the kids were able to get up and interact. Um, a lot of teachers were marking the role with the students coming up to the whiteboard and finding their photo <laughs> and clicking on the photo or um, so the teacher wasn't traditionally marking the role from a piece of paper. The kids were actually coming out and saying, yes, I'm here, and they're physically bursting a balloon or finding their photo. Um, so, right. yeah, so things have come a long way. But like you were saying with the, with the pods, 
you know, the collaborative pods at UTS, you know, that was a huge learning curve yeah. for a lot of academics. But now it's natural, that's the thing. Yeah, I've actually watched academics teach so well in those spaces um, in Building 11. And we've got, there's more of those spaces all around the university now. Um, so they're moving away from those large lecture theatres. And if you have a large lecture theatre here at UTS, a lot of the chairs swing around so you can have that group discussion. Ah, uh, uh, yes. So the chairs, so you can, and, and you can sort of turn around and talk with the people behind you. And It's very informal these ways, uh, these, these days. It's very informal as compared to how rigid things used to be done, especially in the university. Uh, so I, I'm personally very glad for that. Mm. It's just uh, I think that's... If we are, if creativity say is one of the outcomes, then you can't be rigid. You've got to be fluid, and all these settings and environments just help to that. So, um, um, I think it's time to move on to part three of our interview, which involves uh, just a few quick rapid. We call them rapid fire questions. We try to keep our questions short, but you can take time to answer them. Go for it, Marcus. Okay, so who has been the most influential in shaping the way you teach? Could be a living person or a not living person. I'm trying to think back who was the most influential person. I've met so many influential teachers along the way. Um, I wouldn't say just one, but a few of them. Like in the first year of my teaching career, I met some really inspirational teachers who worked very closely with a lot of these refugee kids and there was one teacher, of course, who used to, you know, do a lot of musicals. You know, we used to have a, a school musical and she used to involve all students, even if they had no English, to having English, you know, getting involved and on board doing things. So I'd say a whole lot of different people along the way. I wouldn't just say one person. So, well, yeah, that's you, okay. No. okay. Who do you look up to now? <laughs> who do I look up to now? <laughs> Um, there's lots of academics here that I, I aspire to, you know, there's lots of interesting people at the university, especially in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. There's, um, we've got some journalists who are great, know their content, but they're also really great teachers. Um, we've got some great, um, teachers in the School of Education. I've worked very closely with a lot of them. I am I'm invited as in the School of Education to, to go and talk to pre-service teachers and I talk to them about professional learning networks and how they need to be connected. They can't just go out into the real world and just think they're going to learn from the teachers within their school, but they're going to be learning from people online. Um, and they need to have those strong professional identities. Um, they need to create a Twitter account. They need to create a LinkedIn account. They need to be seen because um, future employers are going to be searching online, like Googling them to find out <laughs> mm -hmm. who they are. So if you're an academic today, it, it's not about how many papers you've written, but how visible you are in the community through social media. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> I think it's really big. And, you know, in academia, you know, have you written papers? What have you published with teachers? You know, you need to have sort of have something in that space or created things or you know, you might have a Digo account, like your social bookmarking tool. You might have um, an account on Pinterest. A lot of teachers are in the Pinterest space, you know, um, and they're sharing a lot of great resources. I found a lot of great teaching resources on Pinterest. Mm, yes, absolutely. It's very rare, and I'm very happy for you that you are inspired by your by your colleagues and <laughs> you're looking up to your colleagues, which is it's amazing. Like. This is a very good place to be. Obviously, uh, UTS has really changed, has really like, improved in that respect. It's great. There's lots of people on board to help academics. So I'd like to know, what professional development have you found the most useful in, say, the last year that you would recommend to other teachers as well? Okay, Teach Meets are run by Teachers for Teachers, and they're free. Um, and Teach Meets have a website there's a sydney based website and you can put up your hand and present for a very short time in a teach meeting for a teacher and you go along and sometimes they're specific it could be around project based learning it could be about game based learning sometimes those teach meets have got a theme so uh, it could be a stem theme um, so some of the teach meets i've been to have around a theme sometimes they're in the in museums or art 
galleries or state libraries. So the locations sort of reflect what the theme of the Teach Meet is about. How do you attend one of those meetings? Is there a website and you sign up? Yeah, there is a website. There's a Teach Meet website in Sydney and um, you can subscribe to it. You can actually go on their Twitter feed. I think they've got a Twitter feed as well. Um, There's a lot of um, Twitter chats as well. You could follow different teacher Twitter chats. I think there's um, Aussie Ed, I think, is one of them, and they promote a lot of those teach meets. So I really I, I say to teachers, like, get yourselves on Twitter and follow um, specific educators that are going to provide you with the right information for your own professional learning. So those personal and professional learning networks are, are very important. I can't stress that enough with, you know, new teachers. So teachers have to constantly learn. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're a lifelong learner. Like, I have learned so much in my career. And like I was saying, it's it hasn't been lineal. I mean, I've jumped out. Like, I've come to UTS. Um, I've worked for Dell and Intel on a project. I've worked with the Department of Education as a consultant. I've been a teacher. So I think, you know, you have to sort of keep moving and doing different things to make it more exciting and interesting. But I've seen lots of changes in so many different Context. Yeah, constant change. Marcus? I guess uh, probably the last one here. Uh, what advice would you give to educators just starting out? Like I said, um, get yourself to a teach meet after, you know, once you start. Um, join Twitter. Have a strong professional identity. So when future employers, they don't just look at your CV, they look at your online presence. If you have no online presence, and they ask you to teach STEM subjects and do all sorts of other things that involve technology and you're not on online and engaging with other people. Um, so I, that, that's the advice I give to current. Um, and just keep learning. There's so much more to learn. And it's not just learning from your colleagues within schools. You know, it's connecting with other people beyond your school. And global, I mean, we're talking about global context as well. There might be educators. I've learned from educators in other countries. Yes, yeah. It's a global village. I've joined online communities and just been part of, and, you know, people are sharing. I mean, educators now are so willing to share good practice and what's worked for them. And they love that kudos of they've shared it with someone else and then they, that person they've shared it with comes back to them and says, yes, it works in my context as well. And it has a ripple effect on other teachers in schools as well. If you're doing good practice, they're going to say, oh, okay, where did you learn that from? I went to a teach meet before you know it. I mean, I used to have in my school a video conference. It was like a video conference in the connected classroom and it was called Brecky with the Techie and it was on every Tuesday morning. So I used to invite the teachers at my school to come and sit in and um, be part of Brecky with the Techie. So we had all different teachers sharing different things using the connected classroom, just that video conferencing. Yeah, that's that's great. Because if your students are in cyberspace, then the teachers should be there as well. (laughs) So you engage with them in their own environment. It was a whole new ballgame. So um, I'd like to just to wrap it up by asking you... uh, if you have any parting thoughts for our listeners uh, who could be teachers, so many of them are teachers or parents or other stakeholders. And uh, if that's okay with you, how do people get in touch with you if they want to, say, discuss any of the topics that you mentioned today? They can connect with me on Twitter. I'm Ariadne09 on Twitter. They can send me a direct message or they can ask me a question directly on Twitter. So I'm online quite a bit. I'm on Twitter. I'm more av- and I started Twitter when I was at UTS. I was a student at UTS as well. I did my master's at UTS. And it was one of our academics who got us on Twitter. So I've been on Twitter since 2009. Um, and I'd say that's my favourite learning tool. And I've actually connected with lots of um, really great resources. So they can get in touch with me on, on Twitter. Great. Do you have a, a blog perhaps? or? Um, well, We've got our podcast. They could follow along on our podcast, which is um, Ed, Ed Tech Lunch. Um, we're going to do another one. We're going to do it. It's on SoundCloud, yep. Ed Tech Lunch. We'll link to it. And, and we've got our show notes. So on our podcast, we also 
put links to various really good resources. So we talk about different tools, conferences, yeah. Yeah, so I've got a little plug-in for our podcast. No, we happily link to it. And yes. uh, everybody, anybody that's listening, if you want a lot more of this, uh, check, check out, out at Tech Lunch. I will. Definitely. <laughs> Come and have lunch with us. <laughs> yes. Um, I'd like to come to UTS as well. So next time I'm there, I'll, I'll ping you on Twitter, of okay. course. <laughs> we can catch up. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ariadne. I really appreciate making a bit of time in yes, your busy you. schedule to talk to us. And uh, look forward to talking to you again in the... Uh, thank you. Actually, not very near, but uh, mid-future. <laughs> Enjoy thank your you. break. Thank Enjoy. you to both of you. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yes. Bye-bye. That's all for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to our email address, questions at stemiverse.com, and we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode. And subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S T E M I V. E-R-S-E Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.